नरेंद्र मोदी इज अ बिग वीडियो हियर I support that Muslim women students will not be allowed to wear the hijab. Come on, you got to wear bari nisan and you allowing it. The Hindu Sikh community they wear their turban all over. From what you've seen from the Muslim community so far in terms of the protests etc. What, uh, what, what would be peaceful? Would, it's been peaceful, yeah. India's judges are also highly Islamophobic now many many of them. Unhe barood se uda dena chahiye. The police in India are historically anti people. As a Hindu here who's coming on to go ahead and create awareness on this great injustice that's going on madarse ke sare vidyarthiyon ko aise shibiron mein bhej diya jana chahiye jahan se unke dimag mein se quran naam ka virus nikala ja sake we need to do this for the future of our children the future of our great country the future of mankind this is your brother afman ibn farooq and i've got a very important message alhamdulillah our brother edi is setting up the deen center not just the deen show but the deen center a full dawa academy a masjid a dawa center in america the first of its type the a, a ground breaking project and i want everybody as i'm supporting it i want everybody to support it so we can take the dawa to the next level we need the deen center please support it bismillah alhamdulillah assalamu alaikum greetings of peace welcome to the deen show And I'm here with the advocacy director, Amjad. How are you? Thank, Thank you. you. How are yes. you doing? I've been hearing you say "Assalamu alaikum," but you're not uh, Muslim. You're Hindu. <laughs> yes. You're Hindu. But "Assalamu alaikum" is a greeting uh, for everybody, Muslims and non-Muslims. It's a beautiful greeting, isn't yes, it? Yes. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's amazing. Now you are one of the few people I really want to commend you because you are coming out, even though you're a Hindu, you're seeing the injustices that are happening, and you're speaking out against them. Yes, yes. That's true. So, I want to commend you for that and I want to ask you in the recent years why are we seeing such a rise in violence and bigotry against Mus- Muslims in India? Right. So, <clears throat> let me first uh, just say to you that uh, being a Hindu, it is my duty being a Hindu to fight for justice and against injustice against all people everywhere. that is in fact also the message of the holy quran that is the message of prophet muhammad peace be upon him prophet muhammad always said you have to fight against injustice no matter who it is for no matter who where in which part of the world he did not say you only fight for injustice you only fight for justice and against injustice uh, for muslims he said you fight for justice for all people Uh, <clears throat> what's happening in india is very unfortunate i am an indian i am a hindu i come from india and for all my life since i was born and raised we did not see or experience any discrimination yes there were structural discriminations of course against people because it's a, it's a work in progress that society has many many uh, fault lines but the kind of attacks on muslims that we have witnessed in the last 8 years and i say 8 years because it was 8 years ago in the month of may 2014 that india's current prime minister narendra modi he came to power narendra modi is a bigot he is a hindu supremacist he is an islamophobe he is a hater of muslims he has somebody who has presided presided over a massacre of muslims Narendra Modi belongs to a party called the Bharatiya Janata Party that translates as Indian People's Party there is nothing indian about it it is a vile party it is a vicious party with a horrible horrible ideology driving it because the BJP is an offshoot of a much larger organization that organization is called the rashtriya swayam sevak sangh that's a mouthful it's the the original is an indian language it translates as national volunteer corps the rss as it is more popularly known was founded in 1925 so it's about to complete 97 years on just one ideology and that is the ideology of hindu supremacism the ideology of hindu supremacism or it is also known as hindutva is very explicit and it says india belongs only to the hindus non hindus such as muslims and christians are foreigners they are aliens they do not belong to india 
India should be run only by the Hindus for the Hindus and Muslims and Christians should not have even uh, should not have fundamental rights should be treated worse than second class citizens. That is the ideology of the RSS. The RSS is the ideological parent of the BJP. The BJP is in power in parliament in India which brought Narendra Modi into power as prime minister and that is why this ideological movement, this political party being in power in India, it has been driving the violence against Muslims all across India leading to mob lynchings of Muslims, leading to demolitions of Muslim homes and businesses, leading to acts of vandalism and desecration and demolition of Muslim places of worship such as mosques as, as well as Eidgah uh, Maidans. All of that is being done and now they are trying to get Muslims, uh, deny Muslims their citizenship by bringing a new citizenship law. That is what is happening in India. You said Muslims and Christians. Yes. So why do you see a lot of Christians here from America, a lot of politicians, they're Christian, why are they supporting such a movement that is against them? And why do you also have many countries, even you've seen some Muslim countries giving awards to this individual? Well, I, it is a confusion. Yeah, about this. absolutely. I agree with you, brother. And it is this this is the problem with foreign policy for most countries. You can accuse the American foreign policy of many things, but you can't accuse it of being long-sighted of being of being you know on the right side of human rights the problem is that most countries cannot see beyond their noses now that is a critical flaw in the formulation of foreign policy the united states of america and of course organizations such as mine the indian american muslim council and most other organizations we work with we have been battering the American system, the policy-making universe, to do the right thing and to call out bigotry and hatred in India and to call out the Indian government's failure to control that bigotry and hatred. And indeed, we are getting to some point where the U.S. government and its officials and agencies have started talking about it. And going forward, God willing, we will see more and more response. Mm -hmm. But yes, we talk about Christians also because India has more than 30 million Christians, but India has 200 million uh, Muslims. It is only in a country the size of India which with 1.4 billion people where that you can say that you can say that a, a, a group of people who number 200 million is a minority yeah. that's the Muslims so the foreign policy of all these Muslim countries so-called Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia which has given an award to Modi or the UAE the United uh, Arab Emirates which are now in a partnership with Modi all of these countries they do not truly reflect the will of the people there is no question that the people in most of these countries are horrified at the human rights violations not just against Muslims but all people that are being committed by the government of the day but this is supposed to be the biggest, one of the biggest democracies in the world. It is the largest democracy the largest in the world. Demo okay, then they have a police force? Oh my goodness. So why is the police force not stopping the lynchings, not stopping the brutality that's happening against the innocent Muslim population? Great question. Absolutely great question, brother. I thank you for asking me that question. The police in India are historically anti-people. The modern police in India, they were constituted by the British when they ruled India for more than a hundred years, uh, almost 200 years, um, and they left only in 1947. The police were deployed by the British to suppress and crush the opposition to British colonial rule. So the Indian police are fundamentally anti-people. They are designed to be anti-people and anti-democratic. Not very different from the police in most colonial countries. You go to Egypt. I was there in 2011 in Egypt during the Arab Spring. I was at Maidan-e Tahrir and I went into police stations. I spoke to local people and they said the police is the most brutal tool of oppression against us. So in all these countries, you go to Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Egypt, most of these colonial uh, former co colonies of the British Empire, the police you will find are the most oppressive elements of the, of the administrations. Mm. The same is true. Plus, in addition to that, the police in India are heavily dominated by the Hindus. Not just any Hindus, but upper caste Hindus. Hindus that are Brahmins, that are Thakurs, that are, I, I don't know about Baniyas, but definitely Brahmins and Thakurs. Now, those upper caste Hindus 
in the Indian police, they're not just anti-Muslim, they're anti-lower castes also. That is why you find you will be horrified to know that the average custodial killings in Indian police stations and, and prisons, numbers between 8 and 10 a day. So you have... I mean, it, a day? Yes, sir, a day. You have more than 3,500 custodial... And these are the ones that are recorded, right? More than 3,500 custodial killings a year in India. I mean, just this century, we have seen uh, more than 70,000 people who have died, uh, you know, 60 to 70,000 people who have died in custodial killings. Now, they are, they are virulently anti-Muslim. They are Islamophobic. And therefore, and on the other hand, the Muslims of India have very little representation, not just in the police, but in the entire criminal justice system. Although the, the Muslims are more than 12% in India's population, they are hardly 1 or 2% in India's judiciary. You will find hardly 1 or 2% of judges in India are Muslims. Likewise for, for lawyers and prosec government prosecutors. There's likewise for the police. Likewise for administrators. So, the Muslims in India are truly a dispossessed and a disenfranchised minority. They are large, they are 200 million, and yet they do not have representation. And now, because of the politics of the BJP and the way that this, this party has come up, this is, in fact, Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister's government today in India, is the first government since India became independent 75 years ago that does not have a single Muslim as a lawmaker, that does not have a single Muslim as a minister. That is why the Muslims are facing the brunt of oppression and viola violations of human rights from the government as much as from the non-state actors and there is nothing that anybody can do about it. Is it a, f a fair assessment, and that leads into my next question, how strong is the Hindu nationalism extremism here in America, but is it a fair assessment if we call it, because for the, for the layman to understand when you say KKK, this being s synonymous with the KKK movement or even more extreme? Yes, so the KKK wore capes, right? The Hindu nationalists in America do not wear capes. So let me just clarify at the very beginning. Uh, Hindu Americans are a model immigrant community. Many, many, many of them are great people. They are the true, um, they are true Democrats. They live in America. They have integrated themselves in the American society in a great way. Uh, they, they are loyalists. They are great patriots. They are great citizens. They, they are doctors, they are engineers, they are businessmen, they hold high positions. As we all know, companies like Google, Microsoft are run by Indian origin people. At the same time, there is a minority of Hindu Americans in America who adhere to this ideology of Hindu nationalism. Just a few months ago, a leading Hindu, uh, a leading Indian American activist named Tenmori Sondar Rajan was invited by Google to do a speech on caste-based discrimination. Tenmori Sondar Rajan is a Dalit. The Dalit caste is a former untouchable caste. The most unfortunate aspect of Hindu society is that it is vertically divided in different castes. And, and this is unique to the Indian, Indian Hindu society. So there are lower, the top castes are called Brahmins and the lowest castes are called Dalits. And there was a time in India, and there still are some people in India who do not even like to be touched by a Dalit. There are cases in which a Dalit man marries a Brahmin woman and the Dalit man is killed, is murdered. Oh. Yes, they're called untouchables. They were called untouchables, right? And it is against the law to, in India to discriminate against the Dalit people. Now, Tenmari Sondar Rajan is a, is a fiery activist. She's an amazing woman, an amazing activist. She lives in the United States, and she was invited to speak at Google. More than 3,000 people in Google wrote to Google executives, Google leadership, and said, we don't want her to speak. Now, it is suspected that many of these 3,000 people are upper caste Hindus working in Google. So, and then there are organizations. So, it's Hindus speaking up against this Hindu. Uh, she's, uh, she's not, not Hindu, she's Dalit. Dalit. She's Dalit. Yes. yes, because she does not consider herself Hindu because they discriminate against her. Mm -hmm. But the Hindus consider the Dalits to be part of Hinduism. It's complicated, brother. Yeah. All right. But let me come back to the point. And the point is, there are organizations such as the Hindu Swayam Sevak Sangh, HSS, which are a mirror image of the RSS. There's an organization called the Vishv Hindu Parishad of America, which basically translates as World Hindu Council of America, which has the same name as the Vishv Hindu Parishad of India, which is World Hindu Council. You look 
at them, you look at their activities, you look at their ideologies, they seem absolutely to be joined at the hip. Then there is Hindu American Foundation, which has recently filed lawsuits against so many people because they barely said, well, these Hindu organizations are connected with the Hindu government, Hindu organizations in India. And it bristled at the idea and filed defamation lawsuits. But if you look at the politics of Hindu American Foundation, they're completely in sync with, with, the, with, with the oppression of Muslims back in India. So, and then there is, there is an organization that calls itself Overseas Friends of the BJP, OFBJP. Now, BJP is the, is the acronym for the ruling party of India, the BJP. Now, this one calls itself Overseas Friends of the BJP. It's been ex in existence for more than 20 years. And in 2020 election cycle, it just rushed to register itself as a foreign agent. So what does it mean? It leads us to suspect that it is actually getting money from India. Otherwise, why would you register yourself as a foreign agent in America? This is called Overseas Friends of the BJP. Now, when you have all these organizations in America, you know clearly that they are up to mischief. And that mischief is Hindu nationalism. Now, that this, these people, they go around the country trying to influence uh, the interfaith community, the school boards, the police departments, the, the city councils, uh, the mayors, the, uh, the House of Delegates in various states and legislatures, the state governors, and of course, U.S. lawmakers. They try and influence all of them and say, hey, do not go against India. Do not speak on human rights violations in India. Do not speak about, do not take any action on the minority, on violations of minority rights in India. That, a bulk of these people, these organizations, they do that. And that is why we consider them to be fairly strong. But brother, we are, what we know in our hearts, is history is on our side. The whole idea that repression, bigotry, discrimination has no future in a world that is increasingly liberal, that is increasingly pro pro progressive, that is increasingly pluralist. We are confident that these organizations will bite the dust in the United States of America. Their ideologies will bite the dust in the United States of America. And we will succeed in ensuring that the flag of pluralism keeps on flying high. But in order to do that, we have to fight the good fight and continue doing so. I want to get your reaction to this video here. I support the killing of the Muslims and the Sikhs in the Republic of India because they deserve to die. Terrible. Filmed, I believe, in Canada. I don't know if you know this individual. No, I don't. He's openly advocating to Imagine. kill uh, Muslims, not just Muslims, but those who people confuse as Muslim Sikhs. Imagine. Imagine. Yeah. This is Islamophobia. This is pure Islamophobia. Now, this, unfortunately... Is it, so this is just an example. If I can imagine if someone's brave enough to do that here, what are they doing over there where they have the backing of the police and the military and the government? Right. Right. So yes, so we just saw uh, a, 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 an affidavit has been submitted by, a, by an individual in an Indian court just three days ago who is a former member of the RSS, the paramilitary Hindu nationalist movement. And he has gone on record in a court to say that the RSS is involved in bombings across India, which is then blamed on Muslims and they are arrested and that they are sent away to prison for years upon years. So the RSS the, the, the ideological parent of the BJP, the ideological uh, found of the, these Hindu organizations in America, such as the HSS, the Hindu American Foundation, the uh, uh, um, um, Seva International, or the bunch of these organizations, the Vishwindu Parishad of America, it's fundamentally a Nazi-inspired, a fascist organization, which has been involved in violence for decades. And that is the truth. So it's a violent ideology and they are exporting violence of language, violence indeed, all around the world. Uh, tell us before we conclude, uh, we saw recently, not too long ago, what happened with the case where you had the Muslim women students who are being discriminated against their hijab. What's the latest with that? Yes, so the latest with that is that India's Supreme Court has listed that case for a hearing. Now this happened in the month of January in a state called Karnataka. It is in the south of India. That state is ruled by the BJP, which is the party of India's Prime Minister Modi. I talked about, uh, uh, substantially I talked about this political party. This is a hardcore Islamophobic anti-Muslim party. It's a, and because they have, no, this is something very important to understand. 
the various state governments run by the BJP and the federal government of Prime Minister Modi have been hugely inefficient. They have failed at governance over the years. The, India has been sinking into poverty. More and more, hundreds of millions of people are more and more sunk into poverty now than they were before Mr. Modi came to power. Be, to hide their gov failures of governance, they keep on harping on the anti-Muslim policies. That's what they do. So this happened in the state of Karnataka, where the state government, out of the blue, for no reason absolutely, it's, it's, it sent out, it created a new law saying, Muslim women students will not be allowed to wear the hijab. Now that has become, no, thousands of Muslim girls have lost their year. They could not even take their exams because of it. They went to the state high court. Uh, the state high court did not accept their petition because, the, like I said, India's judges are also highly Islamophobic now, many, many of them. Yeah. And they are, they are they're giving completely partisan rulings. It is laughable. It's shocking how the Indian judiciary has collapsed under the pressure of Hindu nationalism. It's completely unbelievable. There was a time not too long ago when by and large the Indian judiciary was considered non-partisan. It was considered in many ways on par with Western democracies. But now the Indian judiciary has completely collapsed in the, on the, uh, under the weight of Hindu nationalism. So the High Court in Karnataka, it ruled against the Muslim women. They, they immediately went to the Supreme Court in the month of February and the Supreme Court said, oh, there is no rush to hear this case. So as a result, thousands of Muslim girls and women have lost their uh, ear. Now the case has been listed before the Supreme Court. I can only pray that the Supreme Court will do the right thing, follow the Constitution of India, which is explicitly clear and it says that no one shall be discriminated against on the basis of religion. But you never know with what's going to happen with the Indian. Yeah, that's a clear violation of something that's just spelled out right there. Yeah. It's a violation of international law. It is a violation of India's constitution to deny Muslim women from wearing their hijab to schools and colleges or anywhere because the Indian constitution discrimin uh, bars discrimination. The Hindu Sikh community, they wear their turban all over in schools, in colleges, in their jobs, in the army, in the government, everywhere. And they are not stopped. We, I want to commend you once again. And would you be willing to come back on if we have someone from that party who wanted to come on and go ahead? I would love to talk to them, sit across the table and talk with Hindu nationalists in America. All right. If we I doubt, them. though, whether they will join you. Well, we try to keep it open and fair and balanced. So if there's anybody from that party like to come on the Dean Show, we'll bring our friend here on and let's get to the bottom of things. Thank bring you them very on. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful work and contribution as a Hindu here who's coming on to go ahead and create awareness on this great injustice that's going on. Like I said, it is the duty of all right-minded Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Jains, Sikhs, Zoroastrians, Baha'is, Buddhists. It is everybody's duty, including the duty of people of non-faith, no, of no faith, to fight for justice for everybody. God bless you. I cannot leave without giving you a gift. If you're not yet Muslim and you tune in to see what these Muslims are talking about and you like a free copy of the Quran, go ahead and visit thedeanshow.com. We'll take care of the postage and everything and get it delivered to you. And if you still have some questions about Islam, call us at 1-800-662-4752. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. This is your brother, Hamza Andreas Dorzis. And I want every single one of you to support Eddie from The Dean Show financially and otherwise. But in what way? I want you to support his new project, The Dean Center. It's going to be a transformative experience, this center. Why? Because it's going to be a masjid. It's going to be a place of worship. It's also going to have fitness facilities. And it's also going to be a dawah center to call people back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muslims and non-Muslims. And we trust Eddie completely. I for one will take a thousand bullets for Eddie. He has a vision. He has more than 15 years of experience in the dawah. He's had a huge success with the Dean Show. And he has the support of many du'at and preachers and scholars from all around the world. It's going to be an amazing project for everybody. Go to the deancenter.org, donate now. Oh uh -huh.